Thursday, only a secret from... A Buck hero Rogers. pilot brings down his jetliner in a wild belly flop landing. New pictures of President Reagan in the hospital. And plasmatic Wendy O. She beats the rap. Also tonight, reports of a purge in Poland. A verdict in the Sam Goody record pirate trial. The G.I.'s general passes on. And the phone of the future goes wherever you go. The Yankees in a romp. The Mets blank the Cubs. Highlights in action sports. And some showers will be in the area this evening, but it will clear tonight, and the sun will return tomorrow. This is the award-winning Action News with Pat Harper, Steve Bosch, Jerry Girard, and Roberto Toronto. Good evening, everyone. Sunrise over America tomorrow will also bring the dawn of a new era in space technology. A smooth countdown, a good weather outlook, and the high spirits of all involved with the Space Shuttle Columbia are coming together for tomorrow's momentous launch. Marvin Scott has a report from Cape Canaveral. After nine years and ten billion dollars, America's first space shuttle is ready to fly. Final preparations for the launch began in the pre-dawn hours with a rollback of the rotating service structure. That's the huge movable gantry that provides access to the shuttle at the pad. At daybreak, the gleaming white shuttle sat majestically against the blue Florida sky. As crews prepared to load the giant fuel tank with half a million gallons of liquid oxygen and hydrogen, astronauts John Young and Bob Crippen went through their last landing rehearsal in specially designed jets that fly like the 107-ton space plane. Then it was to bed for them at 4 p.m. They'll be awakened around 2 a.m. So will the 4,000 members of the news media accredited to cover the launch. That's more than were here for the Apollo moon launch 12 years ago. Almost 500 press representatives from 20 countries are also here for this one. The Voice of America will be carrying the blast off in four languages, including Russian and Chinese. As the countdown proceeded without any new hitches, NASA officials held their final press briefings. I have a feeling uh, we're going to go tomorrow. Now, we're uh, in good shape. As you can see, we're sitting at uh, T minus 12 hours doing what we do best, and that's holding. The crew's health is excellent, and they couldn't be more ready for the flight. The weather tomorrow should be very much like today, excellent for STS-1. Officials can launch up until 1 o'clock Eastern time. The time frame is important to provide for good lighting conditions in case there has to be an emergency landing. But whenever the space shuttle takes off, it'll look and sound something like this. Seven, six, five, four. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. In seconds, the three liquid-fueled main engines and the two solid rocket boosters will generate seven million pounds of thrust to slowly lift the shuttle toward orbit. Two minutes, 12 seconds into flight, the solid rockets will burn out, separate from the external tank, and parachute to a water landing and recovery in the Atlantic Ocean. The boosters will be refurbished and used again. The orbiter's main engines will burn for about six more minutes. Just before reaching orbit, the three main engines will shut down, and the giant external tank will be jettisoned. It will fall harmlessly into a remote ocean area and will not be recovered. Powered by the engines of its orbital maneuvering system, the Columbia will continue into orbit on this mission about 150 miles above the Earth. There will be no cargo in the payload bay on this maiden voyage, which basically is designed to give the shuttle its first real test in space. If the shuttle passes that test, it'll be flown back here to do it all over again in about six months. Once the shuttle is fully operational, that's expected to be sometime next year, there could be blast-offs from this pad once every two weeks. But first things first, and that's the maiden voyage of the space shuttle Columbia, set for blast-off at 6.50 a.m. tomorrow. At Launch Complex 39 of the Kennedy Space Center, this is... Hello, I'm Scott. John Chancellor, and tomorrow on Nightly News, the story of the space shuttle. I'm Roger Mudd. Roy Neal, reporting from Houston, will have the latest on the space shuttle's maiden voyage. Tomorrow on NBC Nightly News, John Chancellor and the NBC News team. Experience you can trust. NBC News Update, sponsored by Volkswagen Jetta. Volkswagen does it again. Here is Jessica Savage. Good evening. The Senate Budget Committee tonight rejected President Reagan's budget because it doesn't add up to a balanced budget by 1984. 
The House Budget Committee has approved a defense spending package that authorizes $6 billion less than the president wanted. If we're going to do a job, a responsible job for the American people, we've got to look at every area carefully and not just isolate one area and say that's a, it, it's an untouchable. President Reagan today vowed to, quote, come off the bench as soon as possible to defend his economic package. And the body of another black male was found... Next. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Uh, An ABC News Brief brought to you by Budweiser Beer. Now, Ted Koppel. Good evening. The Senate Budget Committee tonight rejected President Reagan's tax and spending cut package. The committee had been approving parts of the plan, but rejected the overall package 12 to 8 because it wouldn't achieve a balanced budget by 1984. Police in Atlanta today found the body of Larry Rogers, a 21-year-old retarded black man who had been missing since March 30th. Rogers, the 23rd victim in Atlanta's 20-month-long string of murders involving young blacks. The countdown is continuing at Cape Canaveral for the launch of the space shuttle. The weather is predicted to be good, and the launch is expected to go on schedule at 6.50 Eastern Time tomorrow. We'll preview the mission and look at the military applications of the space shuttle tonight on Nightline. Now then. This bud's for everybody who puts in a hard day's work. For all you do. This bud's for you. Another picture of President Reagan in the hospital was released today. Taken yesterday, it shows the president looking at a get well card sent by his staff. Doctors say the president may be released this weekend. There was good news about the recovery of Press Secretary James Brady today. Doctors say his mental capacity will be unimpaired and he'll be able to resume his profession. Now stay tuned. Good evening, I'm Hugh Downs. Broadcasting tonight from the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And this is 2020. News Magazine, 2020, tonight. It's the first major step to moving our civilization and the facilities of that civilization into space. Space Shuttle, unusual bird, on the pad, waiting to fly, challenging the future for Americans in space. What's special about the shuttle? What will we learn? U Downs reports, the voyage of Columbia. But 11 years ago this week, our whole attitude was uh, we were going to do everything humanly possible to bring him back. An explosion in space on the way to the moon. Could the astronauts be brought home alive? From Mission Control, a plan needing teamwork and timing. Frank Reynolds looks back. The ordeal of Apollo 13 in a moment of crisis. I'm almost 55 years old, and I am the keeper of the idiot. And he makes my living for me. Jerry Lewis, a man and a cloud who lives in a world of comic madness. Now at 55, divorced, free of drugs, bankrupt, and after an 11-year absence, he's back on the silver screen. A new movie. The critics panned it, but the public loves it. Tom Hoving with a profile of a powerful and passionate personality. Jerry Lewis. Up front tonight, the Space Shuttle, a big challenge in space exploration and a big chance for us Americans to show ourselves that we have not dropped behind in a competitive world. The challenge is simply to get the Space Shuttle and look at the size of this full-scale model, up away from the Earth and into orbit, back down again for reuse. We have main engine start. All three the flight starts just after right. dawn tomorrow, if things continue to go well, at Cape Canaveral in Florida. After liftoff, the solid rocket boosters will drop off in the Atlantic and be recovered and reused. A little later, the liquid fuel tank, empty by then, will fall and burn up over the Indian Ocean. The shuttle will move into orbit around the Earth about 150 miles out and go around the Earth three dozen times until late Sunday morning. As the Earth turns under it, the shuttle will follow a path that will take it as far north as New York and as far south as Argentina. Late Sunday morning, the plan calls for the shuttle to break out of orbit, re-enter the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean, and glide to a landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. The orbiter is called a shuttle. Its name is Columbia, but it's called a shuttle 
because it will shuttle between the hard ground and outer space. Up to now, an astronaut had to take off in a rocket and return in a capsule, which splashed down in the ocean. It's an 80-ton glider. Okay, your nose wheel's about 10 feet. Just over half about 2 feet. Why the shuttle? Money. Lower cost. The shuttle can be reused maybe a hundred times to bring down the cost of sending a payload into orbit or bringing one back. Way, way down. The shuttle is a big space truck. The Pentagon expects it to give America a superiority from a military standpoint by launching satellites that are warning satellites, fighting satellites. Astronomers look to the shuttle to launch giant telescopes that will allow us to see the farthest reaches of the universe without the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Surely the shuttle will open the door to a revolution in communications with satellites that can handle up to 25 million simultaneous telephone calls. And no doubt, one day, the shuttle will carry in its cargo bay the components of orbiting factories and space communities, all in a volume much as we're in now, which is a cargo bay area of the shuttle, about the size of a railroad boxcar, with one important difference. The men and women who work in this boxcar will be working in the vacuum of outer space, because even with the doors closed, there will be no air in here. They will be wearing space suits. They'll make their way along these yellow handholds, weightless. And the doors, which look like a vaulted silver ceiling above us, and now closed, will be open while the craft is orbiting. And there's an important reason for this. Let's take a look at a model. One of the reasons for these doors goes beyond merely the loading and unloading of space cargo. You notice that they are lined with silver panels. And because of heat buildup in the shuttle, to control that temperature, these doors have to be capable of opening. And on this mission, uh, they, they will have to open. If they fail to open, uh, the shuttle will cut short the mission and land after a few orbits before the heat builds uh, unacceptably. If they open and fail to close, then astronaut Crippen will be obliged to don his space suit and come out into the cargo bay area and close them by hand because the shuttle cannot re-enter and land with these doors open. This mission is full of firsts, the first space flight of the shuttle, the first test of a new kind of insulating tiles in the heat of re-entry, the first manned space flight that has not been tested unmanned, and incidentally, the first Americans in space in six years. Not all of these firsts are favorable. On paper and in theory, all of these things will work. But if theories and drawing boards were all that were necessary, there would be no such thing as test pilots. And that's exactly what Crippen and Young are on this mission, test pilots. There are 34,000 of these tiles glued to the outside of the shuttle to protect it from the heat of the friction of the atmosphere on re-entry. No two of the tiles are exactly the same size or shape. Now, these tiles have come loose in tests and during transport. NASA now believes that they will stay put. Well, this cockpit and the other crew spaces, and not just for Crippen and Young, but for uh, others, scientists and specialists who will be making other missions, is very cramped. And the reason, again, money. This is an orbiting truck, remember? And the bulk of the space is allocated to cargo. That's the meaning of payload. Landing one of these space shuttles isn't easy. I tried it in simulator some months ago, and several times I blew tires. I'm bringing the nose up a little bit so we don't build the speed up too much. Now, we want to anticipate this next turn so we don't have to turn back. That's right. Go ahead and roll back. Roll back and look at your pitch. Huh. There's a 1,000 feet. Pre-flare? All right, gear it down. Wheels are coming down. No, 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 just okay. slowly. Don't rock and roll it. Okay. We're long, we're long. Uh, well, we're running off the runway, but outside of that. Oh, damn. I, did I hit too hard? Did I blow a tire again? Son of a gun, I'm rough on tires. <laughs> well, that was a simulation, of course. Right now, the real space shuttle, Columbia, is on launch pad 39A at Cape Canaveral in Florida. We'll go there in a moment for the latest information. 
And for a story told by Frank Reynolds about a moment of crisis faced by the crew and ground controllers of Apollo 13, which lifted off from that very same launch pad 11 years ago. That ordeal was a tough lesson in emergency responses for many of the same people who will control the shuttle mission. After this. Product that no medicine cabinet should be without. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh. Alka Seltzer. <laughs> Alka Seltzer. For upset stomach and headache, nothing works better. Nothing is more soothing. Alka Seltzer, America's home remedy. For eighty thousand dollars, you can buy a truck that doesn't use any gas, a diesel. But if you don't need 18 wheels, then buy the new Toyota Diesel. Its standard 7-foot bed carries a full 1,000-pound payload. A fuel-efficient 5-speed is standard. It's built from the ground up to be a truck, not a car. And for the price of one of these, you can buy 11 Toyota Diesels. The new Toyota Diesel. It's what a diesel truck should be. Oh, 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 diesel! When you spread on Glidden, you get something beautiful to show for it. Frank gave me a beautiful painting for my birthday. Rembrandt? Oh, Glidden! Oh. Do you always use the high-quality spread? Of course! Glidden! Oh! Once it was the center of attention at my parties. Then I painted the walls with Glidden. Glidden, when you make a very good paint, it shows... You know, for business insurance, Fireman's Fund fits almost everyone, large or small. For example, it helps insure the mighty Boston Symphony and Manchester Music, Pet Incorporated, and Fridley's Crossroads Store, even Sunkiss Growers. So for your business insurance, ask your independent agent about Fireman's Fund. Large or small, this hat is just your size. In the yellow pages, Fireman's Fund Insurance Companies. Sunday on those amazing animals, see how they tame the king of the jungle and meet a very clever camel. Thank you. Next, the special all-star family feud as the city slickers from It's a Living and the Jeffersons challenge the country cousins from Dallas and the Dukes of Hazard. Next, Chris Christopherson takes on the Smokies and the baddest truck on the road. This is the bear. We got us a roadblock. But there ain't no way he's going to let them stop the convoy. Sunday on ABC. Here at Houston, the controllers for the space shuttle mission have come on duty for the long night of the countdown to tomorrow's launch. Men and women have been guiding America's space efforts from here for 16 years. Our entire space program has been built on testing from the early missions of Mercury through Gemini to Apollo. Each project was built on knowledge gained from missions that went before. Sometimes they learned from trouble. My colleague Frank Reynolds is standing by at Cape Canaveral, Florida, where tonight the Space Shuttle Columbia, America's latest program, sits on pad 39A in its final countdown, moving closer to the next venture away from Earth. Frank, how do things stand at the moment? Hugh, the countdown was resumed late this afternoon after a planned hold of about 12 hours. Tonight, the three fuel cells in the orbiter have been activated, a check has been made of air-to-ground communications and tracking systems, and a backup astronaut will check all switches in the crew cockpit to make sure they're set just right. Although this is a new adventure, many of these same pre-flight checks were carried out before the launch of the Apollo spacecrafts. And it was 11 years ago this week that the Cape was in the same state of readiness for the launch of a space mission that did not turn out as expected, but did have a happy, almost miraculous ending. On that power transfer. April 11, 1970, Apollo 13 is ready for launch. It is the fifth time the United States will send men to the moon for the third time men plan to land there. Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert will attempt on Apollo 13 something never done before. Lovell and Hayes plan to land in the rocky lunar highlands, far from the relative safety of the flat lunar seas. All three are test pilots. They are used to danger. It's their life, and it's in their blood. They are among the best in the world. In the words of writer Tom Wolfe, they have the right stuff. Lovell, the spacecraft commander, 
America's most experienced astronaut. This will be his fourth trip into space, his second to the moon. Hayes, pilot of the lunar module Aquarius. He'd tested aircraft like the lifting body and flown contraptions like the lunar landing test vehicle. His colleagues consider him one of the most qualified astronauts ever. Swigert, pilot of the command module Odyssey. He had tested the Rogallo wing, a plan to land Gemini spacecraft by glider rather than parachute. NASA discarded that idea as too dangerous. He had been assigned to Apollo 13 only the day before. A replacement for Ken Mattingly, who'd been exposed to German measles. Swigert knows the command module like the back of his hand. He's written the book on what to do if things go wrong. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. Saturn V, building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust, and it is clear the tower. As Apollo 13 begins its journey, lunar missions are thought routine. But the flight of Lovell, Hayes, and Swigert will bring them and the men and women of Apollo Control together in a moment of crisis. The beginning of the mission is routine, relaxed. As the astronauts start toward the moon, they turn the command module around and dock with the lunar module Aquarius. It's a complicated maneuver, but the astronauts are so confident, they broadcast the docking live back to Earth. Yeah, we're just about there. About uh, ten, 10 more feet now. Roger. Looks pretty good down there. There is plenty of work to be done during the coast to the moon. The three parts of the Apollo spacecraft form a complicated machine, and each part has its job. The command module, Odyssey, is the astronauts' home. It will bring them to the moon and back to a landing on Earth. The service module carries the supplies for the round trip. Aquarius, the lunar module, will bring Lovell and Hayes to a landing on the lunar surface. The astronauts have systems to check, photographs to take, TV feeds to be made on schedule. But it is the men in mission control who do most of the work. They have the huge computers, the radar tracking devices, the teams of people who monitor every part of the spacecraft. It is the work of men like flight directors Gene Krantz and Glenn Lunney, controller Cy Liebergott, and capsule communicator Joe Kerwin that makes Apollo missions possible. Good morning, 13. The spacecraft's in real good shape as far as we're concerned, Jim. We're bored to tears down here. Monday, April 13th. Apollo 13 is 180,000 miles from Earth, three quarters of the way to the moon. Its speed is nearly a mile a second. Lovell and Hayes are checking out the lunar lander and giving a TV tour to anyone who cares to watch. The public interest has fallen off, and none of the networks carries the show. Apollo 13 will reach the moon tomorrow, and there are many small problems and details to attend to before the crew goes to bed. Okay, Jim, uh, it's been a real good TV show. Uh, we think we ought to conclude it from here now. Uh, what do you think? This is the crew of Apollo 13. We everybody there a uh, nice evening, and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back for a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. One of the small things that needs attention is a problem Cy Liebergott, one of the experts for the command and service modules, has been nursing all evening. He has been having trouble finding out how much is left in one of the service module's tanks of super cold oxygen. It is one of the cryogenic tanks, or cryos, that provide the spacecraft with its oxygen, power, and water. To get a better reading, Liebergott needs the tank to be stirred. He doesn't know that inside that tank, a switch had fused shut during a routine test on the ground two weeks before liftoff. It had allowed the tank to overheat. And now, inside a tank of pure oxygen, the wires for its fans and heaters were bare. The insulation had melted. It is a bomb waiting to explode. And it can go off any time the tanks are stirred or heated. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to... Uh Stir up your cryo tanks. Okay, stand by. Swigert hits the switch, and in the service module, four feet behind him, the fuse is lit. In seconds, the insulation is in flames. Bathed in pure oxygen, it burns furiously. The top of the tank blows off, and the tank becomes a blowtorch, spewing fire and hot gas inside the Apollo service module. Vital lines tear, valves slam shut, and the side of the service module blows off. 
Instantly, half of the astronaut's oxygen supply is gone. And within minutes, two of the three fuel cells that generate power and water will die. The astronauts don't know what has happened. They know they're in trouble. Okay, Houston, right, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the uh, caution and warning there. Uh, to me, it was a shutter. It was a muffled shutter. All I really thought was this is not normal, and it may be something very bad. There was doubt in our minds uh, exactly what caused the noise. Uh, nothing made sense because what it uh, what it what it said to me was that I had lost uh, oxygen tank number uh, uh, two, and oxygen tank one had a leak in it, and I had lost two fuel cells. Return. For the next 15 minutes, the astronauts and the ground struggle to understand the problem and cope with it. In mission control, it seems impossible that something that serious could have happened at all. And at first, they think that their instruments are lying to them. We may have had an instrumentation problem, flight. Is there any uh, kind of leads we can give them? Are we looking at instrumentation? Have we got a real problem or what? It became fairly clear within, oh, 30 minutes or so that we had a desperate situation on our hands. We were losing all the electrical power in the command service module and the breathing oxygen. And it looks to me, looking out the uh, hatch, that we are venting something. Or, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. We're losing oxygen from our second and last bottle. It became very obvious to us that we were going to lose the mothership. Here is a bulletin from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. No lunar mission had ever failed, and Kranz and his team try everything. But the explosion has destroyed the service module's ability to generate power and water, and with that gone, the command module is slowly dying. The command module is the brain of the spacecraft. It has the computers, the guidance equipment. Only the command module can re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. But the service module is the heart. It carries the oxygen, power, and rocket fuel for the round trip to the moon. Okay, now let's everybody keep cool. We got the uh, limb still attached. The limb spacecraft's good. So if we need uh, to get back home, we got a limb to do a good portion of it with. The only way to get home was to use the uh, lunar module as a lifeboat. The lunar module is a spacecraft all its own but it was designed only to land on the moon. It carries supplies to last two men two days. Its rocket has half the power of the service module engine, and it was not designed to return to Earth. Somehow, the LEM supplies have to stretch to keep the men alive, and the LEM rocket has to do a job it was never meant to do, change course back to Earth. Getting back in Apollo 13, which a lot of people don't realize, was a series of milestones. We would overcome one obstacle, and then something, something else would, would crop up to give us a challenge, to try to make us figure out what to do. Well, without the ground help, uh, we never would have gotten back. No one is more aware of that dependence than the men in mission control. This is their ultimate test, but it is more than that. Three of their friends are in danger. Are you satisfied that both of these tanks are going down and we're past helping them? Even with batteries. Uh, that's, that's what I'm getting at. I'm trying to be sure that you're satisfied that there's nothing else we can do. Our whole attitude was uh, we were going to do everything humanly possible to bring him back. But the astronauts can't turn around and come back. They've gone too far and are going too fast. They have to go around the moon. But their present course will take them far out into space. They have to change that course and use the moon's gravity like a slingshot to throw them back to Earth. It's called a free return course. If we could get back on that free return course to get us around the moon and back to the Earth, even though we intercepted the Earth in a matter that uh, did not allow uh, ourselves to survive, I mean, a direct impact or something like that, it would be much better to end the mission in that manner than to be a permanent monument you know, to the space program by orbiting the Earth forever. They have to use the lunar module's rocket, the one meant to land them on the moon. This maneuver has to work. If it doesn't work, there's almost no place else to go. And as most of you are aware, there is no rescue possible in space flight. The rocket burns only a short time, 31 seconds, and it puts them back on course for Earth. But it will take four days to reach the Earth. 
and their worries are only beginning. Four days is much longer than the lamb is designed to last. Will it have enough oxygen? Will it have enough water? Can batteries meant to last only two days be stretched to last twice that long? And the lamb can't bring them all the way home. Only the command module has a heat shield capable of withstanding the 5,000 degree heat of re-entry. But never has all power in a command module been turned off in the cold of space. And no one knows if it will ever work again. Tuesday, one day after the accident, Apollo 13 is behind the moon 250,000 miles from home. The ground decides to speed up the return and use the lunar module's rocket a second time. This time, the burn will last four and a half minutes and bring them back to Earth nine hours faster, heading them toward the Pacific, the only place in the world that recovery ships are stationed. The burn will use three quarters of the fuel they have left. Each of those procedures and maneuvers had to go right. And uh, we recognized the chance for, for something going wrong in any of the maneuvers was, was large. And, uh, but we were all test pilots. We'd all been in narrow situations before. This is another one of those. My attitude was one that we'd do everything possible right up to the very last bit. If we bought the farm after that, well, uh, we, we, we would go out knowing that we had done everything that we could do. Jim, you are go for the burn. Go for the burn. Roger, understand. Go for the burn. The burn works. And for the first time, the astronauts are on their way back to Earth. But in mission control, there is no time for congratulations. Many problems remain. Communication is difficult. The radio is drawing its minimum power. What I remember mostly during the long hours of return is sitting hunched over at the console with my headset on and the volume turned all the way up. And the, the voice contact with the crew would be an occasional thing, low in volume through a whole lot of hash and static. I'm afraid I didn't copy that, Fred. Wednesday, 200,000 miles from home. As the astronauts watch the moon recede, they have turned off nearly everything. Only the radio and a fan to circulate air are left on. The entire spacecraft is operating on the power it would take to light three 100-watt bulbs. The spacecraft is dark and getting cold. The temperature here was about 38 degrees, but it was more than that. It was a clammy cold. It made sleeping very difficult. And what sleep you did was very restless. It was not good sleep. It is the first time since the accident that the astronauts have had a chance to sleep at all. Ironically, the astronauts make far more news for failing to reach the moon than they would have for landing successfully. People who know or care little for the machines that bring them there know what it means for those machines to fail and care about the men that fly them. Lord, your astronauts will come back safe. Mission Control is developing the plan to bring them back to Earth. If everything in the spacecraft remains off until the last possible minute, then, just before re-entry, the command module can be brought back to life using the power of three small re-entry batteries. There will be just enough power to last until splashdown. The plan is tested in simulators on the ground, and it should work if nothing more goes wrong. But something does go wrong. Apollo 13 is drifting off course, and if not corrected, they will miss the Earth entirely. Here is a special report from ABC News Space Headquarters in New York. ABC News Science Editor, Jules Bergman. Apollo 13 is now 160,000 miles from home. And Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert, in a beautiful piece of engineering piloting, are battling to keep their crippled spacecraft working. The all-critical event, that mid-course correction engine burn that must work, is now less than four hours off. On their present heading, they'd skip over the Earth, missing it by about 98 miles. The correction is a small one to change their speed less than six miles per hour. But that is the difference between life and death for the astronauts. They have to follow a very precise path to hit the Earth's atmosphere at the right angle. Too shallow, they will skip off and go back out into space. Too steep, and they will burn up on re-entry. It was literally flying by the seat of your pants. I had uh, in the spacecraft a, uh, a reticle or a gun sight that hung down in the window. We have two hand controllers for attitude. Uh, Fred has one, I had another. We got the Earth in the window, 
maneuvered it around. Of course, everything is manual now. All the exotic autopilots and the guidance system, everything is off. So at the proper time, Jack said, start the burn. I pushed the button, and the engine went on full blast immediately. And 14 seconds later, Jack said, stop, and we pushed the stop button, and the engine stopped. And, and after that, we waited. The ground radars soon tell them that the course correction has worked, but the spacecraft is still drifting. The whole procedure has to be repeated. It was a matter of having faith in the ground as far as what the maneuvers were. Uh, we, we had no, absolutely no guidance or navigation capability at this point, so uh, the solutions were strictly based on the ground track and uh, was really just follow the yellow uh, brick road. There is no yellow brick road for the men in mission control. Each new step has to be improvised every step of the way, and they have a deadline to meet. Apollo 13 will reach the Earth on Friday, going 25,000 miles an hour. The astronauts have only one chance to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Thursday, 150,000 miles from home. The plan to bring the command module back to life is radioed up to the astronauts. It takes hours just to read it. And no one knows if the plan will work at all. The command module has gotten so cold that the ground fears the batteries may have frozen and the circuits may break as they warm up. Friday, the carrier Iwo Jima steams to the point in the South Pacific where it will wait for a capsule carrying three cold, tired men, men who are not at all sure they'll make the appointment. Two and a half hours before re-entry, the command module is still dead. But when Swigert starts to turn on the power, the batteries work. The procedure is long and complicated, and things sometimes take more time than expected. The Earth kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you knew that you had limited time to accomplish all those tasks, to get everything done, because as we approached the Earth, we were going to hit that atmosphere, and you had one chance. Fred Hayes is sick. He has a fever of 104 and severe chills. He continues to work. Finally, it is time to cut loose the crippled service module. For the first time, the astronauts see the damage. And there's one whole side of that spacecraft missing. Is that right? It's really a mess. Next, the astronauts pack up and move to the command module. The LEM, Aquarius, has saved their lives, but it is doomed to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere and must be jettisoned. Farewell, Aquarius, and we thank you. From now on, it is the command module on its own, and there are still uncertainties. The capsule is still drifting and may leave the re-entry corridor again. If we had, you know, somehow missed the Earth, drifted on by, uh, it was my intention that we would uh, remain alive as long as possible, uh, even though that our, the hope for survival was, was uh, uh, you know, lost. And that maybe towards the very end, we all we had to do was to depressurize the spacecraft by by opening up a vent, and uh, you know uh, we could have done ourselves in that manner. Okay, I'll flag Even if the capsule enters perfectly, the astronauts and the ground fear that the heat shield may have cracked when the oxygen tank exploded. If it did, Lovell, Hayes, and Swigert will be dead within seconds of hitting the Earth's atmosphere. For several minutes, there is no word. The heat of re-entry blocks all communication. As the recovery helicopters take their stations, there is still no contact. In mission control, the wait seems to last forever. Long after they expect to hear from the astronauts, they hear only silence and static. Capcom, why don't you try and give them a call? Odyssey Houston, standing by, over. Okay, over. Okay, we read you, Jack. Visual contact, slide. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the main. It really looks great. Apollo 13 was a failure, but in a more human sense, it was a triumph. A 
triumph of men over their machines, a triumph of the nerve, skill, and brains of the men of Apollo control, and three astronauts, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert, tested in a moment of crisis. And with me now is the man who first said those words, literally heard around the world. Houston, we've got a problem. Jim Lovell, the commander of Apollo 13. Jim, what did we learn from Apollo 13 in terms of men and machines and training and so forth? Well, I think we learned quite a bit, Frank. Number one, we learned that uh, everything doesn't work uh, the way you want it to work. That we're all fallible to some degree. But two, we learned that we can come back from a potential catastrophe where just about everything goes wrong, and with the willpower and the knowledge and the skills from the ground and from the flight crew, we can get back safely. But it doesn't mean we can overcome anything at all, does it? I mean, you were pretty close to the edge there. Well, we had to uh, leap over a series of uh, you know, hurdles to get yeah. back home. Uh, we just uh, finished one problem and another one would crop up. But it did give us the flexibility and, and sort of a sense of satisfaction to take something that was unusual and make a success out of it. Well, we discovered the outer limits of man and of the machines, too, didn't we? That's right. Yeah, we pushed them just about to the limits. Mm -hmm. And now you're a quiet, conservative businessman <laughs> leading a prosaic <laughs> life. Huh? Yes, I found out that even outside in the uh, private sector, it's just as hectic as the space program. Well, what do you think about tonight as you look out there at 39A? You know what it's like to be here the night before a launch when you're going to ride something up into space. Well, I'm... Just a little bit envious, obviously, because you see the same thrills and the, the same excitement down here at Cape Kennedy that you, I experienced years ago and would, and would just love to be in John's spot just one more time. Well, we're very grateful that uh, you're not going to be in the kind of a spot that you were in once before, <laughs> and we certainly hope that that doesn't happen to this crew. Thank you very much, Jim Lovell, for coming by tonight. Thank you, Frank. It was a great triumph, of course, but it was also a very close call. And especially when you remember that uh, the night before the launch of Apollo 13, 11 years ago, there was really the same sense of confidence here at the Cape that is present tonight. Now, nobody here or in Houston expects serious problems, but they must anticipate, they must, that something could go wrong. And it is kind of comforting to recall that many of the same people who brought Apollo 13 home are also actively involved in making sure that Columbia comes back safely. You? Thank you, Frank. We want to remind you, ABC News will bring you coverage of the Space Shuttle Columbia over the next few days. Well, next on 2020, Tom Hoving has a profile of one of the most remarkable comics of our time, or any other time, Jerry Lewis. Citizen. If Papa could only see his face, introduce him. The Kodak Colorburst 350, the instant camera with a built-in close-up lens and the sharp, rich, vivid color of a hundred years of Kodak experience. I look like an American. The new Kodak Colorburst 350. Kodak brings the instant to life. We want to make you smile. Welcome back. He brought a friend. My boss hasn't smiled the whole trip. Mm, all right, back. I think you'll like our beds. Mm, big room. Everything all right? That's fine. Call me for dinner. In an hour. We made him smile. Come to a holiday inn where your smile says you're number one for pleasing. Beat the high prices. Come make your best deal on a big selection of eligible new 1980 Series 10 Chevy Love trucks, two- or four-wheel drive, and we'll top that with a $700 cash bonus. Or make a great deal on any eligible new 1981 Series 11 two- or four-wheel drive Love, and we'll top that off with a $350 cash bonus. Use your bonus as part of your down payment or get a check from Chevy. $700 or $350. So come get them while the getting's good. The making of Taster's Choice. Take the best ground roast fresh per coffee you know how to make. Then freeze it. To lock in all that fresh perk flavor when you remove the ice, you'll have rich, natural chunks of freeze-dried coffee made by a premium process that's unlike ordinary heat drying. 
Taster's Choice, regular and green label decaffeinated. The only leading coffee that's freeze-dried. Jerry Lewis, a grown man and a zany clown, and he's made his first movie in 11 years. Tom Holving with a profile of Jerry Lewis when 2020 continues. Friday, when Johnny and Eva met, it was the beginning of crazy time. She switched colas on me, gave me C&C. How could I tell? We saved a lot of money. We did? Break the expensive cola habit. Try C&C. I came to see for myself. I could not believe what I've heard. <gasps> That's incredible. They are actually charging more for some instant coffees than for Savarin Instant. My Savarin Instant is made with the finest beans, which I choose myself. It's a coffee with character. Why should you pay more for any instant than for Savarin? Savarin, instant coffee with character at a great price. Financial problems at the city's nursing homes and hospitals are getting worse. Workers at eight nursing homes had payless paydays today, and the astronauts of the Columbia Space Shuttle are getting their last hours of sleep before blast-off tomorrow morning. In Atlanta, the body of Larry Rogers is discovered, the 23rd victim in a series of murders in that city. And in sports, the Mets and the Yanks both win their opening games of the 1981 season, and the Islanders skate right into Game 2 of the Stanley Cup playoffs. All coming up on Eyewitness News at 11. Teletone tomorrow night, 7.30. Movie critics have a special place in the life of Jerry Lewis. The more they lambaste him, the more people flock to see him clown. It's happening again right now. His new film, Hardly Working, his first picture in 11 years, opened last week across the nation. The reviews are mostly bad. The box office is great and building. Already almost $5 million in six days, making it America's number one current box office attraction. Here with a profile of the zany clown who confounds the critics is Tom Hoving. Thank you, Hugh. A couple of years ago, the name Jerry Lewis and the man himself seemed to have disappeared. He wasn't hardly working in the movies. He was not working. Now that's all changed. The Wall Street Journal this very morning had a feature story on the film, the financing, and its surprising success. In articles and ads, Variety is trumpeting the astonishing comeback. It has never been fashionable to like Jerry Lewis. It's sort of like a secret craving. You know, you don't want to let everybody know about it. I was an early fan of Jerry's, then a skeptic, and now after I've met him, a lifelong fan. See if you agree. I talk about Jerry as another being, which he is. He's nine years old. And the guy you're talking to is not hanging from a chandelier. He's not lighting your jacket with a cigarette lighter or cutting your tie. So it's another man. I'm almost 55 years old, and I am the keeper of the idiot. And he makes my living for me. And the idiot is back, making a living on the screen. After an 11-year absence, 800 theaters across America are showing his latest film, Hardly Working. The critics were scathing, but his public loves him and are turning out in record numbers for the film. They have loved him since 1949 in the myriad antic guises he has devised for his 42 films. Over the years, his fans throughout the world have shelled out over a half a billion dollars to see him, a record matched only by one or two people in show business. For his 43rd film, Jerry is still coming up with things for the very first time. I had never been to a disco where the girls dance on the bar, and I, I thought to myself, 1981 or 1980 at the time. I'm a, a man of almost 55 years old. It's not allowed that there were things that I haven't seen. And being as square, mid-Victorian, and, and old-fashioned as I am, it was a mouth opener. I mean, they do some cute little things there. A grown man or a nine-year-old, Jerry is really split into two people, the 55-year-old and the irrepressible antic child. <laughs> He's part of me. How does the middle-aged Jerry manage to call on the child? I mean, I could call upon him now. But it would mean that I just have to 
take a cigarette for a second because I'm just learning how to smoke, and I like it. I know it's going to stunt my growth, but I don't care because big people do this. And then after that, maybe I can go up in a room with a lady. <laughs> Joe Stabile, Jerry's manager for 19 years, looks upon Jerry as one of his children. Claudia and I have six children. Three, three, plus Jerry is seven. That's one part of him. Like He loves to get, be mis mischievous. He loves to get into things. Jerry loves anything that's shiny, any brass object. So Claudia and I were shopping one day, and hours. we found this brass I porthole with a mirror in it. And Claudia said, oh, the old man had loved that. We've got to get it. We've got to get it. He looked at it, and he said, I got it. That's great. And he had a whole gag in mind that went into the movie. This is Jerry's 50th year in show business, 50 years in which he has invented and perfected the outlandish routines and comic characters his audiences treasure. This recent performance at the Olympia in Paris is what's known in showbiz as a dumb act or a record pantomime. The voice, of course, belongs to Mario Lanza. It's how Jerry started his career in burlesque houses and small-time theaters in and around New York. But the big time came when Jerry Lewis was accidentally teamed with an obscure singer named Dean Martin. It was at the 500 Club in Atlantic City, July 25, 1946, and by the next day, crowds were fighting to get in. Eight years later, they returned as heroes, and Atlantic City named a street after them. By the time they made it to Broadway's biggest movie palaces in 1949, they were the hottest act in show business. Their fans turned out by the thousands, hoping to catch a glimpse of the gifted team or get their hands on photographs, which Dean and Jerry obligingly rained down on them. Jerry clowned and Dean crooned. The crowds that jammed the theaters roared their approval. The perfect straight man playing off the perfect idiot. A show business marriage made in heaven. The key and what the secret of all of that success was, was the ability of two men to show love and affection one for another in front of an audience. That's all it was. Because I'm embarrassed to say to you that we were getting $250,000 a week at the New York Paramount for one guy saying, did you take a bath this morning? And the other guy said, no, why? Is there one missing? And on to Hollywood, where in 16 money-making films, Dean remained cool as a cucumber, while Jerry was crazy as a loon. Hey, you. Huh? Is that a real dummy you got there? This is really a real dummy. Cut it out, please. That team, which grossed up to $4 million a year, seemed unbreakable. In movie after movie, they were the odd couple who remained fast friends. After what we've been through, nothing can separate us. That's right. <laughs> that was until 1956, when exactly 10 years to the day, they went their separate ways. Dean had so much talent. He was, and is, the best straight man that ever lived. There'll never be another like him. His timing was innate. It was inborn. It was part of his breathing process. He was magic, and that's why Jerry this, Jerry that, Jerry this, Jerry that was devastating, because he knew in his heart that he was the key to making the idiot work. We all have egos and vanities and needs, so that any time I would come to Dean with anything based on an idea of mine, oh, another Jerry, another notion that's his, or he'll this or he'll that, which I didn't understand then. I understand it now. That was the end, and I knew that. And I was responsible for the break. I, I motivated it, provoked it, and knew it was right. It was heartbreaking, emotionally devastating. Without knowledge that I would be accepted as a single, I had to do what I had to do. And what Jerry had to do, he had to do alone. the television series. It moved from one network to another and was as much a strain on the audience as it was on Jerry. Supposedly, he was difficult to work with. With his powerful and passionate personality, he looked exaggerated on television. Perhaps he was a little too much to have in your home every week. But some of those same qualities which failed him in television helped him in film. 
He challenged the Paramount Brass with his bold concepts. He ordered the construction of an enormous single unit set for ladies' men, a 40-room building three and a half stories high. He was the first to use television monitors and videotape on the set to check on his work in progress. His technical innovations and filmic style are taken seriously by film experts and scholars. I see Jerry Lewis as um, a great filmmaker. He's bold, he's inventive, he dares, he understands the rules of film and he's not afraid of them. He can break them, he can throw them out the window. Uh, he's a purely original American artist. Be specific about some techniques in some of those specific films. Well, many of the jokes that Jerry Lewis makes on film are jokes that are really film jokes. And, and if it were any other medium, you, you couldn't have the joke. For instance, in Aaron Boy, when he's stuck in the elevator with the man with the toothpick in his mouth, I mean, it's a cinematic joke more than it is anything else. Without the tight framing and everything, you don't have a joke. He's very modern in the sense that he gives you the distance. He says consciously, this is a film. It's a piece of modern art, the self-consciousness of it, saying you were watching a film. Aren't you overacting a little bit, Miss Bowen? Down, down. It's a movie, see, I'm fine. The people in the theater know I ain't gonna die. Here, it's a movie state. Here, look at it, see? There's wires and lights, and I'm gonna make more movies, so I couldn't die. It's like a make-believe, it's a dumb city. Mr. Lewis, you are a complete nut. The nut Jerry Lewis has not only studied in schools, he teaches as well. In The Nutty Professor, he plays a bumbling teacher with a pipsqueak voice. But at UCLA, Jerry is a popular guest lecturer, and having never attended college himself, ten years...